begged and pleaded for me to go. I didn't out what so I came out with her in Davis, and I wasn't going to drive. I didn't, didn't want to drive from Davis all the way here to work, oh, I see. and then back up, and then back up to Davis. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Will you get a take? <laughs> oh, shoot. I forgot. So, I haven't done like usual, but can I take the notes for the class like usual, and then turn it into the end of class? Because you see, it's all class. It's all done. No. Got it, got it, got it. James. Why did you only have an hour and a half? Matthew. Why did you only have an hour and a half? Because that's how long the period was. What are you talking about? Yeah, this is a really long test. I'm like, yeah, it was. It took a lot of work. I'm like, yeah, there was a lot of work. Yeah, it's pretty hard test. I'm just like, what are you doing? I'm just like, I'm getting for like the magnetic field because what I did is I did that. Gravitational field. Gravitational field. I didn't do that elsewhere. Really? So what's the squiggly line mean? That just meant work. Oh, okay. What? I think Balagai has better handwriting. <laughs> what? Where? <laughs> I have I have no misconceptions that I have like chicken scratch handwriting. It gets worse like on boards because I'm not actually looking really when I'm Austin. This was making fun of me because I was talking and I was writing over the work that I had already written because I wasn't paying attention. What? Not not mostly. Like, if I have to, you know, transpose something? You don't, you, don't, you don't do that when you drive them, right? What? You don't do that when you drive them. Oh, heavens no, I test. <laughs> Lewis. <laughs> Lewis. Lewis. Sorry. Lewis. <laughs> Sean. Yeah. 
No, this is not Tucker Dixon. Really? It's definitely Tucker Dixon. Okay, because I was told that like, like Ocam, which is all up here, is another division class over here. Why did you like? Yeah, because my girlfriend, she's a junior over at the division, and she's taking Ocam, and she's considering another division class over there. So I was just wondering if this was. Yeah, in any university, this is definitely Ocam. Isn't it just uh, linear algebra and discrete math are the upper division ones? No. Those are typically lower division courses. Really? I thought, I thought linear algebra was a junior level class. There is an, there's an alternative. There's another linear algebra course you can take. Oh, okay. Um, did you happen to see a green binder in the last class? Class, it was an actual binder with rings. Yeah. There was a green binder in the ladies' restroom for several days. <laughs> I didn't remember it was you who asked. I just remember somebody asked, and so I, I put my, all the grades on there. Okay. Are these, like, including all of the three, so far, quizzes that you have late? No, they're not on there, but all you have to do is put attendance. Okay. Um, you guys, I'm sorry, we're behind. Didn't I finish up by asking a question I never answered? Yes. Did we have it? It was a box. That was a box. You just, you just want the numbers. You still, in your notes, I'm not changing anything. You didn't assign any homework on Friday either. Okay. Do, do you have to draw that box? I can draw boxes. I can't draw them. They're all So everybody, apparently here's a question. I got a box. I apologize if it's a goofy question, but it's one that can answer pretty quick. I've got a box, and it's dimensions of three by four by five, <coughs> but there's going to be a small change in each of those sides, and I've indicated those changes in my parentheses. My question is this. Can we come up with an approximation for the corresponding change in the volume? <coughs> Because I think the change in the volume might be relatively difficult to compute. Well, maybe not in this example, but all of it is. And if it is, I have a tendency to use differentials to approximate those small changes. So I will think of the actual change in the volume as approximated by this total differential for volume. It's just that when it comes to the differential for volume, can't I interpret this as, um, I can't, you guys, I need some letters. Since these dimensions are changing, do you think instead of saying this length is 3, can I call it x and maybe y and maybe z? And I think this total differential could be interpreted as nothing more than the partial of my volume with respect to uh, x times a small change in the x direction, plus a partial of volume with respect to y. Well, times a small change in y. And then finally, plus a partial of v with respect to the variable z, I'm just going to multiply by the differential for z. And I think to compute these partials is a piece of cake. Can I get away with not writing this? The volume of this box is nothing more than x times y times z. So, hear me. What would the partial v be with respect to x? Z? I agree. And by the way, evaluating what x and y and z, and also the x, the y, and z, are those values in my picture? Like a piece of cake, you guys. I just slap you number one. Is that going to give me a, a 20 times 0.1? Is that plus a 15 times 0 0.2? And then finally plus a 12 times negative 0 0.3? Or shall I say, I've got a 1 plus a, um, okay, I can't do arithmetic. I made a mistake. 
20 times 0.1 is 2. two. <laughs> Excuse me. Is that plus a 3? Wow, my numbers are this nice. Watch here, you guys. Look at that. Another slight mistake. I think I said it out loud as a negative. I just didn't write it. Is that a minus 3.6? Or shall I say in the end I got a 1.4? Oh no, I can't. I just lost track of what I'm doing. What does a 1.4 represent? Change, change in volume. Corresponding change in volume. Well, let's take that back. It's an approximation for the corresponding change in the volume. Do you guys agree? Don't we need like, you know, something like over T or, you know, I guess one, if the change, volume is changing 1.4 what per what? Ooh, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> this is not a related race issue. I was simply trying to approximate the actual change in the volume when x and y and z changed in these fashions. So I was not interpreting the volume as, as some kind of quantity changing over time. I was simply saying volume is stagnant, but I had the specific change in these quantities, x and y and z. What's an approximate corresponding change in the volume? Oh, okay. So I really did not differentiate implicitly here at all. I was simply using a total differential to approximate the changes. Just like you guys use differentials to approximate changes in y values and curves, Back in math 30. I'm just doing it on higher dimensional space. Do you guys agree? So I apologize, we left class, I never finished that exam. Let's do something different. I want to talk about what's going to happen on some kind of surface. So here's a surface. I don't know if it's quite actually uh, an elliptical parabola, but certainly is a, a shape that looks like one which has a local min value on the surface. Well, I should say local min z value on the surface, which clearly occurs right over here. Wouldn't you guys think you could say, look at my picture? If you were to plant your feet at that local min and take a peek at the curve traced on the surface, that's scaring me. It was dry race. Moving in the y direction. What's really happening at the local min? The rate of change in x and y is zero? I think in the y direction it's zero, but I think you're right. If I were to move in the x direction, like in my green path, I think here too it's going to be a, a zero value for the rate of change. Well, at that local min. And so I think of the surface in three space, or even higher dimensional space, has a local min or local max. It certainly is going to be the case. That these partials are both going to be equal to zero. And I apologize for making that, note, that letter f up in, f up in air. I really meant f is a function that describes a surface, at least in three dimensional space. Now, I also think that if I can somehow discuss concavity occurring right at that particular point, even though I've got a local min, it looks like all the concavity is in the air. direction. And I'm going to look at concavity the same way I did back in math 30. I'm going to look at a second derivative. Well, I misspoke. I'll interpret it in terms of a second partial derivative in terms of concavity. Now, this is another function I'm not going to motivate, but I just want you guys to consider this function as well before I give you a really important theorem that has to be in your back pocket. Man-made definition. Let's be c be equal to f as a function, two variables. I will define d as a function in terms of x and y as being nothing more than the second partial for f with respect to x times the second partial um, for f with respect to y minus the mixed partial twice. And if this is awkward to remember, there's a really easy way to remember it. This is nothing more than the valuation of a two by two determinant, where I've got partial of x to x twice. No, that was <laughs> is that an x squared? No, no, sorry, that's an x y. My apologies, I said oh. mixed partial. I wrote a two instead of a one. Okay. That wasn't the point there. So that's not. And that's a, is that what's that? Is that a square to prop? It is, and if you don't remember the way I'm writing this, you don't have to. Okay. I think there's a shortcut to remember it. Look at this 2 by 2 determinant. Here's my mixed partial twice. And here's my second partial for f to y. But cheapest, you guys, back in math D, the way you computed these 2 by 2 determinants, didn't you multiply down the main diagonal? Oh, look at that. That's where it is. 
minus the product on the non-main diagonal, and that's exactly what that term is. So if you don't want to remember my nifty little formula, you don't have to. So you guys ready for a big deal theorem? Mm -hmm. It's a big deal theorem. Is it a big deal? Oh, very. In fact, it's so important. Can I give it another name? I'll refer to this as my second derivative test. So I want you to consider a function in two variables. Say f. For which? Second partials are continuous. And I want you to determine all critical points. Well, I, I'm just using FTC, uh, FCT to abbreviate continuous. Or CTS, I mean. Well, consider a function. And determine all critical points, which, by the way, are merely points, a comma b, for which both the partial for f, with respect to x, evaluated there, is equal to 0, and the partial of f with respect to y evaluated there is equal to 0 as well. So considering all such critical points, Here's a test I'm going to give you. So number one, if d evaluated at the point a comma b is positive, and I can discuss the concavity, say for example, um, the second partial for f with respect to x, evaluated there. If that's going to be positive as well, then I've got upward concavity, which means that the point A comma yields a local minimum. Sorry for that. In addition, if it's the case that this, uh, this D function evaluates to a strictly positive number, and my second partial for F this time is strictly less than zero, then I've got downward concavity. And a comma b yields b yields a local mass. If it's the case, part three, that this d function, you guys can call it d because it's really acting like a determinant, which is exactly why I use a notation. If this determinant evaluates to being strictly less than zero, then a comma b yields no local term. By the way, you guys, if I got a if I got a point a comma b that yields no local extrema, I sometimes refer to it as a saddle point, being just like that point right in the center of my hyperbolic paraboloid. Oh shoot, you guys, I'm not done. One more line, one more line, and I promise I'll stop talking theory and we'll get into some practice. So fourthly, if it's the case that that function d evaluated at a comma b is equal to zero, <coughs> excuse me, then um, then um, I have no clue. In other words, I might have a local max, might have a local min, might have a saddle point. I just have to use some other techniques or analysis to determine what the answer really is in terms of what occurs at that point. So you guys, can I, can I make up a really easy first example, a really easy one? Let's look at our standard um, circular paraboloid. So if my function f is represented this way, let's find all of the extremes. Well, 
everybody, I think the first thing I need to do is find critical points, which means I've got a system of equations to solve. I need to actually solve both these equations simultaneously. The partial of f with respect to x being set equal to 0, and the partial of f with respect to y being equal to 0. This is how I'm going to find my critical points. You guys, please bark at me if I'm walking too fast. Doesn't it tell me that 2x is 0 and simultaneously 2y is 0? I told you, I'm choosing an easy example to start things off. So I think my only critical point is indeed at the origin. And you guys expect that because we know what the answer is going to be. We better get a local min at the origin. Now, to verify this really does yield the local min, I will compute that determinant. And that determinant in this particular case ends up being nothing more than this 2 by 2 determinant. By the way, you guys, this is my first example, so I'm writing way too much. Which I think is just this determinant. Actually, I don't know what it is. Is that a, is that a 2? Um... Is that a zero, zero, two? Which, by the way, ends up being equal to four. And so when I evaluate my d function at my point zero, comma, zero, my critical point, I still get a positive four, because it doesn't matter what a, b are in this particular example, which is strictly positive. That being the case, I'm in case one or case two scenarios, since the, the discriminant function values to a positive value. For me to determine whether I got a local max or local min, I now need to check the second partial. Now, the author text says choose the second partial with respect to x. It doesn't really matter. But if I were to take a peek at the second partial with f with respect to x, then they just simply give me this. And when I take the second partial with respect to x, you've added to point a, comma, b, sorry, in this case, that's the origin. Oh, shoot, look at that. It's always equal to 2. It's always strictly positive. Therefore, by this new second derivative test, the point 0, comma, 0 yields a local min. And I know in this particular example it also yields the absolute min, but according to the second derivative test, at least I've got a local min. By the way, if I asked you to find the local min, that means you're going to plug 0 and 0 in for x and y at the original function's input, and of course the corresponding output is going to be a z value, which in this case is 0. So you guys, was it fair, since you and I knew clearly the answer to this question, that I walked through it that fast? Mm -hmm. As I raise my level of complexity, I, I, I won't walk quite that fast. So let's raise our level of complexity. And I have to apologize before I get started, because you guys, I prepared for this discussion Last week, I got behind. I wasn't here Monday. I don't remember my examples. I don't want to make them up out of thin air and waste our time in class. So if you don't mind with the second derivative test, I did make up a few examples. Let's take a peek. What if the output of my function is this mess? How about a 2x squared plus 2xy? Is that a plus y squared? Minus 2x minus 2y plus 5. And I'm not going to write the instructions, but same instructions. Let's you and I dive in and find local extremely. So I think the first thing I need to do is locate all critical points. And those are going to be the points a comma b for which both partials are going to be equal to 0. So I think I need to solve the system. Name the partial of f respect to x and the partial of f respect to y are equal to zero. Doesn't that tell me that 4x plus 2y minus 2 is equal to zero? And it also tells me that, um, actually, what does it tell me? Is that a 2x plus 2y? Minus 2 is equal to 0 as well. Oh, something else I needed to, su to suggest. Um, I'm getting lucky with these examples so far. They're my first examples. I've got to confess, 
This is a system of linear equations on x and y. And when it comes to systems of linear equations, you guys have lots of techniques in your back pocket. The addition or elimination method back in math D, substitution of math D, but you've also got the um, um, you guys, come on. Gauss Jordan elimination of automatic matrix or <coughs> Kramer's rule. Inverse matrix method or Kramer's rule. I agree. What are those? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, she had bad freak out to Here's your college. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, his name was Tom Tron. <laughs> Tam Tron, Tam Tron, my bad. <laughs> you always say, like, names and stuff. And I know, like, the how to do it, but I don't remember which names are which. Oh, but does it make it Is so difficult bad? in science and mathematics to even discuss things so you don't know the names? It does make it difficult. Oh, my arm's getting too tired. I'm wasting all the ink. <laughs> I'm lazy. But I guess I'm not messing Um, you know, I know next semester I will specifically ask you to solve a system using a particular technique. Yes. Stop laughing, Brad. <laughs> but you guys, I got lucky. It's a system of linear equations. I, the reason why I brought this up is if you get a system of nonlinear equations, as a mathematician, I can't tell you how to solve a system. There is no one technique. So I mean, I'm just suggesting to you that with my first examples, they're pretty darn easy, and I can apply all those standard techniques. Does the system linear equations? Because every time you see an x and y, it's only being raised to the first power, and you don't see any products of x and y's. So to solve the system, you guys mind if I just use our math D skills? Can I just uh, uh, can I just subtract the second equation from the first? And I think that tells me that 2x is uh, don't I don't know what it says. 2x is equal to zero, which means x is equal to zero. Now to find y, let's multiply the first, the second equation by negative two. Too much work. Too much work. Why not just plug z or pick up zero off the inkboard, slap it in for x in either one of these equations? I don't care which. How about the second? Plugging zero in for x doesn't that mean that y is equal to positive one? But I think that means the only critical point is located at zero comma. Now, if I'm going to go through my second derivative test, there are a few more computations I have to commit to. Number one, the determinant function. So I think my d function is simply going to be the 2 by 2 determinant. You yell at me. I'm skipping too much. The entry in first row, first column, will be the second partial for f to x. So here's my second partial. Here's my first partial of f respect to x. It's second partial. Isn't it just going to be a 4? The entry in this 2 by 2, 2, two, by two determinant, excuse me, that's in the first row, second column, isn't that going to be a mixed partial? <coughs> well, here's my partial for f with respect to x. Let's differentiate that with respect to the other variable, y. Positive 2. Oh, you know what? This is the same. And now when I compute the second partial of f respect to y, that means just differentiate this piece with respect to y. I just get a 2. And this evaluates to, is that a 4? And that being the case, this discriminant function, or excuse me, determinant function evaluated at my critical number or critical point zero one was still a four, which is strictly positive. So it looks to me like I'm going to have a local max or a local min, and I'm going to determine that by evaluating my second partial f with respect to x. Oh, but I get to cheat. We've already computed the second partial of f with respect to x. I think in this example, here it is. It's another constant function. So when I evaluate it here, it's still 4, which is still positive. Therefore, that critical point, 0, 1, yet again, yields a local low. A local low. You got it. You guys, am I still treading on pretty basic examples? By the way, it's not really a matrix, it's a determinant. 
Any guys, technically speaking, shoot. I should be referring to this as a second, as a partial perspective of my first then aspect to X. But remember, I'm missing any continuity for my second partials, which means uh, Claro's theorem applies. Meaning the equivalent. And so, man, that's all I was doing. I just probably said it too fast. That's why I said yellow. Bottom left, that condition back at Oh, let's see if I got more sophisticated. It looks like I did. How about if the output of my function is an 8x cubed minus 24x1 plus a y cubed. Well, you guys, my tactic's not going to change. I just have to confess, when it comes to the first system equations, I'm going to solve my critical points. It's not going to be the case that I get a linear system. Therefore, I can't use my standard techniques. I'm just going to have to find genius ways of actually solving the system. So let's compute our first partials. I think my first partial with respect to x is, is that a 24x squared minus 24y being set equal to 0? Why did you say because in a sense, I'm looking at these, these curves on my surface for which, at these points, uh, my slope is going to be zero going in the x and y direction. If I'm going to yield a local max or local min, it's going to be the case that at that particular point, both these partials are going to be equal to zero. Just like, just like Matthew, in two space, x-axis, y-axis, if I have a local max or a local min, it's going to occur where my derivative function either is equal to zero or undefined. Same idea, I'm just jumping in the higher dimensions. And I think my partial f with respect to y is, yeah, yeah, yeah. is that a negative 24x plus 3y um, squared? You guys, I'm the one doing all the work. You guys are kicking back and relaxing. Can, can I just make my life a little easier real quick? Can I just get rid of some of these constants? Does that give me the system x squared minus y is equal to 0 and... Is that going to be a negative 8x plus y squared is equal to 0? So I can do some more arithmetic in my head. I don't know. Maybe I should just stop talking. How would you guys solve the system? Solve for Alex. Solve for y and substitute x squared and y squared. I agree. Now when I use this circled equation and this circled equation, Making a substitution, replacing y with x squared, yeah. I think it generates a negative 8x. Um, is it a plus y to the plus, excuse me, x to the fourth? Back to the x. After all, I think the solution to this quadratic factor, if you set the quadratic factor equal to zero with the principle of zero products, yields very clearly non-real complex solutions. So I get to reject. Oh, but shoot, you guys, if x is equal to zero, that means one critical point. is going to be zero comma, I don't know, how do I get the corresponding line value? Plug into either one of those two equations, it doesn't matter which. But I think when I plug 2 in for x in one of the equations, how about the easy one? Y clearly is positive 4. I have two critical points to check this time, unlike my last easier examples. So you guys, I think when we come, when we come into class today, I, I do have to give you more than one example of this, uh, this particular application, because I think they could be very, quite very well, I think next on my list is I better come up with that determinant for this determinant function, excuse me. And to come up with it, I will simply look at this two by two. Do you guys think you could do a little bit of work this time? <coughs> really? <laughs> two X. By the way, in this particular case, ends up giving me a 4xy plus 1. Oh, well, I, I 
misspoke, I meant minus one. Now let me look at those two critical points. Um, here's one. At zero comma zero, I'll compute. Yeah. Say it again, I'm sorry. What did I miss? Isn't it a plus one? The flying one? Plus one. Plus one. No. Was it plus one? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, it is minus one. What about a purpose? What about the purpose? Minus one. We divide it enough because it's equal to zero, but it's not in the moment of need. Oh, you're right. You've got a good point. Um, if I went back up here, though, what would happen is I got an extra factor of 24 with these two and 8 with those two. I just get to pull them out. I know it's going to change the value of it, but it's not going to change the sign, S-I-G-N. So it's not going to make any difference whatsoever. That's why when I solve this system of equations here, it's going to give me the same solutions as I solve with this system. And it's not going to make any difference whatsoever. You can sort of like think of this as a curve in two space. But this one, I know it looks different, but it's got the same x-intercepts. And so that's why it doesn't, well, that's another reason why it doesn't matter. And everybody, did, are you okay with my negative one? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I, I just okay. forgot they were subtracted, yeah. By the way, what is this? Negative one. Which is less than zero. Therefore, we have a saddle point. At the location of zero comma zero. In other words, that point zero comma zero yields neither local max nor local min for the surface. I think, however, if I were to determine my um, determinant function divided by 2 comma 4, I have no idea what I get. Does that give me a 32, 31, which is strictly positive? But my second partial for f respect to x ends up giving me, uh, well, I should say divided by 2, 4, ends up giving me nothing more than 4, which is positive. So what does that say about the point 2 comma 4? It's a minimum. Oh no, it's a minimum. Is that 31? It is a 31. Did I make a mistake? I just thought it was a 3, you know. Something else. You guys are going to make me change my way so much. <laughs> Maybe it's time. <laughs> So, everybody, let's check. Anybody? Um, UVX sine Y and then cosine UVX, right? Yeah, that's what I mean. But I think with the first equation, that necessarily implies that E to the X is equal to zero or the sine of Y equals zero. So I think y is going to be equal to k 